Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the Hebrew scriptures, the book of Genesis, beginning with the 22nd verse. This is a passage that troubles many people. It is the call to sacrifice Isaac. And the sacrifice of a child is something that troubles many people. But we have to be careful not to judge this story through our 21st century sense of what is good and right and acceptable. Those questions of what is good and right and acceptable change as time goes by. As a way of illustrating it, I thought I would share with you a portion of an article that appeared back in the 50s. It was an article that was written to describe what constitutes a good wife. It will help us understand how our understanding of what is good and right and acceptable changes over time. According to the article, if you want to be a good wife, you must be sure to have a delicious dinner ready for your husband as soon as he comes home from work. The article goes on to offer these suggestions as well. Prepare yourself. Touch up your makeup. Put a ribbon in your hair and be fresh looking. Clear away the clutter. Run a dust cloth over the tables. During the cooler months of the year, prepare and light a fire for him to unwind by. Then, when he actually walks through the door, greet him with a warm smile and show sincerity in your desire to please him. Listen to him. Let him talk first. Remember, his topics of conversation are more important than yours. Make him comfortable. Arrange his pillow and offer to take off his shoes. Speak in a low, soothing, and pleasant voice. Don't ask him questions about his actions or question his judgment. Remember, he is the master of the house. You have no right to question him. And a good wife always knows her place. I dare the husbands to try that this week. (laughs) So just a little illustration to show us that our understanding of what is good and right and acceptable does change over time. So with that in mind, I share with you the call to sacrifice Isaac. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And Abraham said, Here I am, my son. Isaac said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, And he said, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For I know now that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. 
And Abraham went and took the lamb and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts upon the scripture be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So here's a question for you. When was the last time you osculated? If you're married, you should probably osculate every day. If you're a parent, you should definitely osculate if your son falls down and skins his knee. Now, if you're not sure what it means to osculate, maybe this will help. Back in the late 1800s, Dr. Henry Gibbons defined osculation as the anatomical juxtaposition of two obiscularis oris muscles in a state of contraction. There. All set now? We're on the same page? Well, if we're not, I wouldn't worry about it. In fact, I would be the first to admit that Dr. Gibbon's definition of what happens when you osculate is a little convoluted. So in the interest of simplicity, let me say that when you osculate, it simply means you're kissing someone. Life is like that sometimes. Like that word and that definition, life sometimes is convoluted, confusing, complicated. It may even get to the point where it feels like your head is spinning around in circles. That's the way a lot of people feel when they read the story about Abraham and Isaac. And God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. So tell me, does your head spin a little when you read this story from the book of Genesis? Even with everything that I said about things changing, what is acceptable, what is right, changing with time, does your head spin a little when you try to make sense of this story? Does it bother you that God would tell Abraham to sacrifice his son? And does it bother you that Abraham would actually be willing to sacrifice his son? If you're like most people, the answer to that question is an emphatic and unequivocal yes. Yes, it bothers you that God would tell Abraham to sacrifice his son. And yes, it bothers you that Abraham would actually think about doing it. For us, the idea of sacrificing a child is repugnant and repulsive. Abraham, however doesn't seem to be freaking out at all as he makes his way up that mountain. Abraham seems to be perfectly at peace with what is about to happen. Abraham's attitude that day brings to mind a statement that Jay Kessler made many years ago when someone asked him a question about Jonah and the whale. At the time, Jay Kessler was the president of Taylor University. So he was a man of learning and logic, but he was also a man of great faith. So he didn't hesitate when someone asked him if he believed that God could really make a fish big enough to swallow a man whole. In response to that question, Jay Kessler said, yes, Not only do I believe that God can make a fish like that, but I also believe that even if he wanted to, the God who made the sun and the moon and the stars could even air condition and carpet the fish. Jay Kessler had a deep and profound faith in God. Abraham had a deep and profound faith in God. That's why 
he wasn't freaking out as he was walking up that mountain with Isaac. You see, when life gets complicated, convoluted, and confusing, as it was that day for Abraham, you can do one of three things. You can throw in the towel, which basically means you give up. You give up on God. You essentially say, okay, Lord, if that's the way you're going to do things around here, I'm going to go my own way. Thank you very much. The second thing you can do is throw a fit. You get angry at God. When life is convoluted, confusing, complicated, you can throw in the towel, or you can throw a fit, or the best thing you can do is throw your hands up to the heavens and trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's what Abraham did that day as he was making his way up the mountain. You see, I am convinced that Abraham knew in his heart, because of his faith, that God wasn't going to actually make him sacrifice his son. Abraham knew it without a shadow of a doubt. That's why he was so calm as he weighed his way up that mountain. If you're wondering how it's possible to come to that conclusion, all you have to do is look at what Abraham says when his son Isaac asks him that question. Isaac says to him, my father, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now think about it. If Abraham was up to no good, that question would have freaked him out a little, but he doesn't flinch at all. Instead of getting all freaked out, Abraham says very calmly, and this is the whole key to the story, Abraham says, God will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. Now, Abraham didn't say that because he was trying to pull the wool over Isaac's eyes. Abraham said that because in his heart of hearts, he really believed it. He really believed that God was going to provide the lamb for the offering. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. As the story comes to a close, we're told that Abraham lifted up his eyes and behind him in a thicket there was a lamb that had been caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and he took the ram and he sacrificed it. He sacrificed it instead of his son Isaac. You see, as Abraham was making his way up that mountain because of his faith, he knew that somehow, some way, God was going to make it all right in the end. God will provide my son. God will provide. I know that God will provide. That's the best thing that you can do when life is convoluted, complicated, and confusing. You keep saying to yourself, God will provide. As you make your way up that mountain, you say to yourself, I don't understand what is going on here, but I know that God will provide. I don't know how this is all going to work out, but I know that God will provide. When I get to the top of that mountain, Everything will make sense because God will provide. I know that God will provide. If you get tired of saying that over and over again, here's another suggestion. Just ask yourself this question. Does God have a skeleton? That was a question that a teacher who taught English as a second language got from one of her students. It happened when they were looking at a large poster of a skeleton. At the top of the poster was the word, inside of me. Well, there was this little girl from India, and she wasn't sure she liked the idea of having this scary-looking thing underneath her skin. So she raised her hand and said, Mrs. K, do you have one of them inside of you? The teacher smiled and said, yes, I have one inside of me. The little girl thought about it for a moment, and then she said, even God has one of those inside of him? Now, a question like that might 
make our heads spin a little, but Mrs. K didn't flinch. She was used to questions like that, theological, deep theological questions from six-year-olds. So she just smiled and she said, if God needs a skeleton, I'm sure he has one. That satisfied the little girl's curiosity and Mrs. K went on with her lesson. Does God have a skeleton? Who knows? It doesn't matter who you are. You and I are never going to be able to understand everything about God, which means that, like it or not, there are going to be times in this life when things just aren't going to make any sense at all, no matter how hard you try to figure it out. When that happens, you can throw in the towel, you can throw a fit, or you can throw your hands up to the heavens and say to yourself, God will provide. Amen.